Hello everyone, uh, my name is Father Jan and I'm in conversation today with Professor Anna Rowlands. Um, both of us will be at the Synod on Synodality in Rome uh, this coming October. Uh, not just us actually, but also um, other members of the Church in England and Wales, uh, thinking of our bishops, uh, Archbishop John Wilson, um, the Archbishop of Southwark, and Bishop Marcus Stock, who's the Bishop of Leeds, um, both elected uh, by their brothers, the Bishops of England and Wales. Also joining them will be Bishop Nicholas Hudson. He's an auxiliary bishop uh, here in Westminster, and he will be at the Synod too, um, chosen by Pope Francis to be there. Uh, alongside um, them will be Professor Anna Rowlands and also Austin Ivra, who are going to be there as facilitators or um, synodal experts. We'll come on to that in a moment, Anna. Um, and also, um, the Church in England and Wales is well represented, uh, Father Timothy Radcliffe, um, the Dominican preacher, um, who you will have undoubtedly heard of, um, is leading a retreat um, for all the members of the Synod as we begin in Rome in October. So what we'd like to do in the time that we have, Anna, is just to think about some of the themes of the Synod, um, have a little conversation. As part of our ongoing kind of discernment here in England and Wales as to why the Synod is important, where we're up to now, and what's going to be happening in October. So a really simple question to start, although Anna's an expert here. Um, for a synodal church, um, communion, participation, and mission. Just say something briefly about why that is going to guide what we're doing in October. Yeah, so, I mean, one of the things that's often said to me, and it's worth kind of clearing this from the table, I think, up front, is, oh, this is, this is a synod on a million different issues or topics. And that's because so much of the media debate um, focuses on four or five hot button mm -hmm. topics that the world is interested in. Very often when I'm with journalists, they will literally flick through documents that have just emerged to look for married priests, women priests, questions of abuse, LGBTQ welcome and so forth. And that's how they kind of almost fill it, a document. Mm -hmm. Now that, from the perspective of those of us who've been laboring on the synodal process for, for a while now, is almost kind of heartbreaking because this is not a synod on a million different mini issues. This is about the renewal of the church, going back to the very core of the gospel mission um, of the church to be a community for all. So the Pope keeps emphasizing, and he says this whenever we meet with him to talk about the synodal process, everyone is welcome, tell them everyone is welcome. So the synod is meant to be much more asking that question about the who of the church mm -hmm. rather than the what of the church. So it's not sorting out doctrinal issues. That's not what this will do. And there's fear of that, I think, mm -hmm. in some quarters, that this is a synod that's going to make big doctrinal changes. Some fear that, some desperately hope for it. I think both groups will be quite disappointed mm -hmm. in a way if they're looking for big doctrinal change because the Pope's focus is on the who of the church, on the question of the way in which our life itself mm -hmm. is sent out and focused on mission to the world. The church is the only institution that exists, not fundamentally mm -hmm. for its own members, but for the sake, as it were, of the conversion and mm -hmm. the salvation of all. So a renewal in that focus on mission. But you don't get to that mission if you haven't actually done your housekeeping mm. and you're not thinking about the kind of community that we are and that we would be drawing people into. So that question of participation, the who question again, mm. who belongs, how do they belong, who participates, how do they participate, and how is all of that being held by the inspiration of the Spirit who pours out on the church the gifts and skills and talents, often on those who we might leave least expect mm. those gifts and talents to emerge from. And this is again how the church is different from any other institution. Yeah. So renewed for mission to the world, renewed in the who question and the how question of participation, mm. and renewed through all of that in communion, in a way of being together. And what could be more important for the world to hear right now in the fractured brittle, divisive mm. times that we live in, the friend, enemy, constant distinction. Who are you for? Who are you with? We mm. are for Jesus Christ together as brothers and sisters, and we are renewed in that mission to show the face of the living Christ to the world. Mm. That's what the Synod's about. It's a huge task, but it's together working through what that means in a concrete way for the church mm. today, for the sake of the world. No, that's really helpful, Anna, and um, that sense of um, working together 
and the mission of the church. When I think back to the tentative beginnings we had here in England and Wales, where um, the people who are listening to us now might remember being part of a conversation in their local parish, um, when all those responses came back, what we were hearing was that people loved Jesus, they loved the church, um, they didn't always think it was perfect, they knew that there was work to be done, um, and I think that they were beginning to understand that this process is a little bit about that, that we all participate through baptism um, in the life of the church, uh, we're fragile, vulnerable human beings, um, and I think you mentioned about Pope Francis saying everyone is welcome. You know, that sense of accompaniment and walking together um, has been essential, really. And I think we've been rediscovering that. That's right. Yeah. And I think that language of accompaniment is crucial, that the Pope is asking us how to walk together. How can we better walk together? And that means how do we accompany each other in our lives? Some of the most interesting material, because I sadly am a kind of synod nerd who had to read every single one of those reports that came in from every bishop's conference Gosh. across the world and all the individual letters um, and individual mm. submissions and group submissions that came in. So I am so aware of how often people actually said, what we want is a church that accompanies us and very often it was things interestingly like how does the church really accompany families these mm. days how are we not kind of collapsing into the culture of individualism a kind of mm. therapeutic culture that simply accompanies individuals but family units are yeah. desperate to be accompanied in their familial identities mm. and the asian bishops conference have got uh, conferences have got some really interesting examples of how they're trying to build accompaniment of families in other contexts, it's accompaniment of people who are um, really having to think through their identities in various mm. ways, and they want the church to be with them as they work out without instant answers mm. what their life looks like in, a, in a, a Christological way. So yes to definitely accompaniment, I think, is an absolutely kind of key note to this. Yeah. And that doesn't mean it's soft and insubstantial. Yeah. No, and, and that's really interesting because when we talk about this accompaniment, um, you know, I think we are learning. Certainly I sense it here in England and Wales when I talk to, to priest friends and lay friends. They're saying, you know, something is happening in our parish. People are thinking about things which are really deeply important to them. Um, and this process has given them the opportunity to, to really think through some of those things. And, and that is really helpful. Now, I just want to move on slightly, if I may, to think about how we're going to accompany each other when we're in Rome. So there are lots of different groups of people who are going to be at the Synod of Bishops. People often think it's just bishops who are there, but that's not quite true, is it? And particularly this time. So could you tell us a little bit about that, Anna? Yeah, so this is going to be um, a very diverse mm. gathering. Think sort of Pentecost and, yeah. you know, the many different people mm. speaking through their different cultures, languages and from their different experiences. So there will be bishops. It remains a synod of bishops. Um, so there will be bishops as a core part of that group. There are people who are there as, as you will be mm. there as non-bishops. Well, we need to say not say non-people. You're not a non-person. You're there as a priest in your vocation, yeah. in your calling and as an expert on synodality. And you will be a voting member. Yeah. Um, I am a non-voting person, um, not because I'm a woman, because there are, for the first mm. time, laymen and women who are mm. voting members of a synod, and that really is a very significant shift yeah. um, in practice. And then there are people like me who are experts who will be supporting the process, but we won't be voting and we won't be taking mm. part in the small group discussions in the same way yeah. that, for example, you will be or Bishop Hudson will be and yeah. so forth. That's really interesting that, you know, um, I was, you know, very taken aback um, to, to receive what is a papal nomination technically um, and you know along with um, let's say the other nine people from Europe I know I've seen the names in the group I met some of them when I was in Prague at the the synod um, the continental phase of the synod you know and amongst there that I think there's another priest but laymen and women and religious um, and it's a very broad mix and I think it's worth saying as well in my role as a national ecumenical officer that we will have fraternal delegates from the other churches That's as right. well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the really interesting things is part of the reason that you're there mm. and people who were involved mm. in the continental level processes is Pope Francis wanted people who were the memory mm. and the kind of the golden thread of connection right from the grassroots 
up to the universal level of the Synod meeting. And that's partly because he felt it was so important not to lose the memory mm. and the experience of where the, where the Synod was most alive in those local contexts. And he thought there was a danger that the universal level could potentially drift off a little if it didn't have that fundamental connection. The other thing is that so much about synodality, which sounds like a word that nobody feels that they really understand <coughs> yeah, or can get absolutely. to grips with, is learned by doing it. It's learned yeah. by practicing it. And you kind of know it when you have been through this really rich process mm -hmm. of conversation in the spirit, spiritual conversation. So you are an expert yeah. in conversation in the spirit because you have done mm. this with groups of people and you've faced tensions and really mm. tricky issues and you've hit upon the main fault lines in the church mm. right now globally in those conversations and you've lived yeah. to tell the tale. So there's a kind of learning, Absolutely. there's a learning that you bring. So you are memory and you are learning and you are the habitual practice of mm. the very method um, that is the lifeblood of, of synodality. Yeah, and moving on to that method, because um, you're making me think back to the time in Prague where we spent time all together. There were 200 of us in the room in Prague and others joining in online. But there was also the, the moments where we were in groups. And, you know, some of those tensions, challenges came out. Um, one of them for me, actually, um, which is quite significant, was that in the group, um, by chance, I presume, I don't know, um, there was a lady from Ukraine and a lady from Russia. And that was very interesting when in the context when we were doing this work, um, there's a war on our continent. And so, you know, when people say that the church is being a bit too introspective, just thinking about herself, actually I would challenge that because we were going through and living through people's real situations. Um, and they weren't daggers drawn, they were actually wanting to bring reconciliation and they knew that their country people were hurting. So I think, you know, you're right. I think the Synod is looking at fault lines, but it's looking at people's real lives. So if we may, just for a moment, because we, we've not got all day, I'd love to be able to talk to you about synodality all day, um, to think about that methodology. Now, I mentioned about the group work, um, and that's where I think these kind of conversations in the spirit are really going to take place. Because we all know when we go to big meetings, when you're in a big room and there are 400 people there, it can be a bit difficult. The smaller groups, I think, are going to have about 10 or 12 people in specific language groups. So how, how do you think that's going to work? Yeah, so I think... Um, well, we all know, um, you know, if you're in a bigger group, the energy sort of disappears yeah. um, and you don't feel engaged, yeah. whereas a smaller group conversation humanises things. Yeah, you know, we're having absolutely. a conversation between two of us now. That's a much more human experience yeah. than sitting in a seminar room yeah. with 40 people or whatever. So part of it is about encounter and also taking time and patience. And the other thing we should emphasise about the method mm. that I think people don't necessarily understand well is how important silence and contemplation yeah. is to that method. This is not meetings about meetings. This is not endless talk and discussion, mm. as often there's a kind of parody yeah. of a synodal process. Silence and contemplation and sitting with a small group of people mm. in a prayerful silence where you hold the complexity of what you cannot easily necessarily mm. fix straight away or do not have the wisdom yet to know exactly how you should yeah. resolve. Those moments of silence and, and contemplation are crucial to that method being something different from a general conversation or a parish council meeting, you know, even terribly well run yeah. or whatever it will be. So we hope that becoming more practiced in that method through small groups will break something open that we do not yet know. And so yeah. much of uh, what I hope for from the Synod process is for what I do not yet know. Mm. Of course, there are sort of some things I vaguely would hope for as any general Catholic, you know, mm. baptised person, parishioner would. But my true hope is for what I do not yet know that this process will deliver. And I am waiting in a prayerful sense. I'm waiting on the activity of the spirit to break that open. And the silence is crucial to that, not just the speech. Yeah, and I think that you make a really interesting point because... I think we said at the, at the beginning that I said, you know, um, Father Timothy Radcliffe is leading a retreat. Mm -hmm. So we're beginning. I don't think any synod has begun with three days of retreat. Correct. So, so that, that really emphasises that point. Although, actually, technically, it begins with the ecumenical prayer vigil. That's very so, true. And the ecumenical officer should remember <laughs> to talk about so that. Absolutely. You know that the Pope joked this week yeah. and asked a group of people, so when does the synod start? Mm -hmm. And they went... With the ecumenical prayer vigil, prayer vigil. exactly, yeah. and, and and they said we got the right answer, thank goodness. So that and the fact that there will be that mm. prayer vigil um, in St Peter's Square 
um, led by members of the yeah. Taizé community uh, and others. That and people have been invited to come from any part of the world to be participants in their own way in praying. Yeah. You know, we will be dependent on the prayers um, of a of a global community of Catholics and beyond for the success. Um, and and with that, this. you know, I think it bears mentioning to to those who are listening in to us that. You know, I've said I'm the National Ecumenical Officer, I think people have heard that now. But you know, some of my Methodist friends and people I work with are actually going to be in the square in St Peter's when we begin. Um, and they have told me, and alongside, you know, my Anglican friends and so many others, that they're praying for the success of the Synod. So, you know, when Pope Francis talks about everyone, he's not just talking about baptised Catholics, he's talking about everyone. So. Um, I think there is a lot to be hopeful for, and like you, I think I'm waiting to, you know, to see what happens, but not looking into a crystal ball, but really trying, and it's a new experience, even for a priest, you know, to, to suggest that really waiting on the Holy Spirit, you know, and trusting, and I think this process has brought that about. Now, I know we've got to wrap up in a few moments, so um, people will be saying there are challenging questions, so Here's one to end. We we'll always leave the hard questions to the end. Um, and people in the church will be asking these questions, you know, the ordinary Catholic. What is this synod actually going to achieve? You know, what will happen at the end of October? Um, I know that's unfair for all the reasons we've just said, but it's a question people are asking. Yeah. People ask me, so, and I'm sure they ask you as well. So what would you say to that question? So the first thing to say is that this is now a feast in two parts. Exactly. So this is the first course, as it were, <laughs> and then there's another course next October to follow. And that's actually really important yeah. because the Pope wanted to slow this process down. Mm. I think he looked at the process after we had met last autumn mm. in Frascati and realised just how complex and how mm. many issues and questions and realities yeah. there were on the table. And he wanted to give the time necessary mm. To walk, at, to think at the pace of walking, yeah. if you like. Yeah, yeah. Um, I often, this is drawn from somewhere else, but I often think that um, uh, running is what you often do, and I do run. Mm. Is you you create a mental void mm. by running. Walking is what you do in order to think and to work yeah. things through. So the two Octobers, dividing it over mm. two years in this way, is to think at the pace of mm. walking. So that means that this <clears throat> year we will be discerning and opening up questions and exploring, I think, where there will be more work needed mm. and deciding where the key areas are that mm. we need to go more deeply and, importantly, how we will mm. go more deeply into those areas. So I would expect this to be deliberately an interim stage. There won't be a final document at this point. There won't be absolute decisions, but there will be surprise things, I think, that will come up on the agenda that will bubble up yeah. that might not be there yet in the yeah, Instrument absolutely. of Laboris or in the, in the document from last year. But I would expect a refining process, a refining and a deepening of the most urgent questions from around the world that face the Catholic Church as a truly universal community, yet always local in particular. Yeah. No, that, that's really helpful. And I think, you know, um, with one of the other hats I wear here, you know, as the director of mission, um, I'm often saying to people that I think what the Synod and what is in Pope Francis's mind is about drawing all the members of the church and beyond the church into a deeper relationship with God and a deeper relationship with each other. Because the church exists to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ and to bring his healing mercy to the church. And you really get that sense. And as we've begun to walk together, I think that's where I'm beginning to realise that it's such a necessary process. So I'm really glad that we've been able to have this conversation today. Um, I hope that we'll be able to have more conversations. Certainly while we're in Rome, we will be letting you know how we're getting on. Um, it's going to be a busy time in Rome. Um, it's busy days. Actually, you know, we're working Monday through to Saturday um, of the four weeks that we're there, mornings and afternoons. You're probably sitting there thinking that's not that much. But, you know, when you're asked to be involved in this process, I think it's there's a lot of work to it's be done. It's intense. It's intense. And people feel a huge sense of responsibility yeah, because they're absolutely. carrying both people's hopes and fears. Absolutely. And anybody walking into that room is walking in quite, both hopefully very free, but quite yeah. laden with that sense of responsibility So I know well. that we'd be asking people for prayers, for us, for our bishops, not just for those of us in England and Wales, but beyond, you know, that we're really attentive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. 
And uh, just to say once again, Anna, we're really grateful. I know that you're off to Rome very, very soon. In fact, um, off to the airport after this interview. So we're very, very grateful for this opportunity and wish you a safe journey. And I look forward to seeing you in Rome and uh, being together for the continuation of this synodal journey. And uh, just thank you very much for your time today. And you for yours. Thank you.